Hello, thanks for joining me. Um, today I would like to do a quick chat about the most recent book that I have reread in my December month of rereads, and that is um, Magister Ludi, The Bead Game by Herman Hesse. This um, has uh, goes under several different titles I've discovered. In German it's called Das Glas Berlinspiel. I hope that's sort of pronounced right, and um, it also is published sometimes, it's known as the Glass Bead Game. Um, but this is by, um, you know, by Hermann Hesse. It was published in 1943 originally in Switzerland, um, and then uh, this particular edition that I read is translated by Mervyn Saville, and it was uh, published in 1949. And this particular copy is from the 14th printing, printing from 1968. Um, so it's kind of tattered. I bought this used a few years ago. Um, and um, Herman Hesse actually won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1946. And this book was mentioned in his um, in his prize um, as one of his, you know, pivotal works. So um, I read this originally... Um, like three or four years ago, and at the time I did not love it, so I really wanted to re-engage with it during my December month of rereads this month, and see um, if see if about see maybe if I could give it another go because I had earlier this year read Steppenwolf by Herman Hesse and had really liked it, so I thought maybe um, maybe I would give it a reread, and I'm really glad that I did. So what this is about. Um, this is set in sort of it's set in the in the future, several centuries in the future, and it is a world where um, there have been centuries of um, you know conflicts and wars, um, and also um, information had become very information and knowledge had become very superficial and. Um, and fragmented, um, and so as uh, it actually, um, there's a word for that called fouilleton, um, which I had to look up. It's mentioned in this in this book, um, and it's actually a word, and it means um, you know light or superficial um, information or fragmented information, and um, you know. Um, I, I think of it as sort of like a chaos of information is kind of what I got from the book. Sort of, it reminded me now, you know, of our, our world now where there's information coming at us at, from all um, angles, from any little minute thing that happens in the world. Um, we get flooded with information about it that might last for, you know, for as, you know, on cable news, some little small thing might happen that may be talked about for days uh, even. Um, and so it really reminded me of sort of this sort of culture that we have now, this sort of Twitter, Facebook, uh, social media, cable news, 24-7 um, information getting thrown at us, but very fragmented and very um, non-contextualized and very, in a lot of cases, superficial information. Um, consumes all of our, uh, you know, consumes our, our whole world and would consume all of our attention if we weren't very careful. But anyway, in response to this world, um, the people and uh, the people had set up these provinces and these provinces um, contain like an they're, they're an order of very educated um, men and they're only men and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, but they um, they um, they exist then to um, study the knowledge that was created in previous centuries and actually um, try to um, synthesize it um, into, instead of being fragmentary knowledge, you know, synthesize it into greater concepts. And sort of the height of this activity is a game called the bead game. And um, the bead game is, um, is a game... From what I could, from what I gather from the book, um, it's sort of like trying to put together different aspects of knowledge and different fragments of knowledge and all different um, sort of fields of study, um, and then um, some sort of unifying concept is then created, and it the game itself has its own language. It created its own language, and it's a symbolic language like Chinese, and that concept is then um, given a, a specific character. And so um, then these characters then go into an archives, and so the bead player has to study these sort of connecting 
um, concepts and then, you know, furthermore, create new ones. Um, and then um, if there is a new sort of unifying concept that's created, um, you know, it gets its own symbol and then it gets it gets studied and then they, there's a committee that decides if it's going to get added to the, you know, the archives of symbols. Um, and so, you know, the, that's really kind of cool, cool game. Um, so what you might end up having is you might have some concept from architecture, for example, and some concept from maybe mathematics or music music or philosophy or something like that, these concepts might come together in some sort of um, unified knowledge or unified concept then would get its own symbol. Um, and so this is um, sort of the height of, of of the activity in these provinces and is all this the big game itself is overseen by a magister ludi it's called, you know, sort of a master I guess of the game. And um, our story takes place, it's a fictionalized biography of one of these Magister, Magister Ludis, Joseph Necht, and um, our biographer is unnamed, but he, um, you know, lets us know that usually they don't write biographies of, of uh, in the order um, in, in these provinces because they consider them fragments. So um, a person's life, you know, a biography is usually fragments of knowledge about that person, you know, small facts. And so the order itself is, you know, concerns itself with unifying of knowledge. And so biographies are often seen as fragmenting of knowledge of a person, fragmented knowledge of a person. So, but nevertheless, the story is told in a biography form and it starts out with our character Joseph Necht as a young boy who is a boy without family so maybe an orphan and he is accepted into an elite school one of these elite schools that only boys actually can can be accepted to so I'll talk about that more in a minute but um he is accepted into the elite school and so he is then um able to, if he completes this education program, he can join this order and live in, you know, this province of Castalia, um, which he ultimately does. Um, and then, but as a young student, he actually encounters another character whose name is Plinio, who, um, is sort of his opposite in a way, because Joseph Neck is sort of naturally born for the order. He doesn't have ties to the outside world. Plinio, however, does. He comes from an aristocratic, powerful family who has ties to the province. And so in some cases, some of these boys from um, aristocratic families can come go to an elite school. They're not intended for the order. They are just intended to get, you know, a really good education and then go back out into the world. And Plinio is one of those. And so he is actually in opposition to Joseph um, Necht, and they have a series of debates early on in school that's sort of their thing that they do is one argues in favor of Castalia, that's Joseph, and then one argues in favor of the outside world, and that is Plinio. And um, I think this sort of sets Joseph up, you know, it sticks with him his whole life as his life progresses then through the order in Castalia and ultimately when he becomes Magister Ludi. Um, Joseph is ultimately a seeker, you know, so Herman Hesse is really good about these kind of characters. Steppenwolf was also a wanderer and a seeker. Steppenwolf, the Steppenwolf character Harry Haller had a different sort of psychology going on because he was uh torn between his uh dualistic self you know between his uh, different aspects of his self um Joseph Necht is not torn between his different aspects of himself he is torn by different aspects of society and so um you know, ultimately, um, Joseph Neck goes through, throughout the course of the book, goes through these series of what he calls awakenings. And um, uh, it's wherever he comes to a realization, you know, he awakens to a new, a new reality for himself. Um, he doesn't struggle to find it as Harry Haller did in Steppenwolf. He awakens to it um, because of a natural course of um, intellectual uh, sort of spiritual seeking that he's done. And, um, you know, so ultimately in the book, um, this story tells his journey through these different awakenings, ultimately then at the end to understand uh, an awakening of his position as Magister Ludi in Castalia and Castalia itself and his position in the, um, in the world and um, how it, he feels that it needs to integrate more um, and become part of the whole. Um, just like the knowledge has to integrate through the game to become part of a whole. And also, um, like the biographer mentioned, like an individual needs to um, not be considered, not 
consider himself a series of facts, but to integrate with a whole. So um, that's sort of the journey that the book takes us on. Um, you know, my experience of it, so I did not get into it the first time I read it, as I mentioned, and I think that Part of this was because of the lack of women in this in the book. Um, you know, only boys are allowed into the elite school. Um, he doesn't. The author Herman Hesse doesn't go into you know girls being excluded per se. It's, they're just never mentioned. And so I think part of this is this is a voice from 1943 when this book was written. And so Herman Hesse was had that voice where there were at existed at the time uh, boys' schools like this were very common that did just they didn't. They just only accepted boys. Um, and so I think that's part of maybe why this is the case. The other part is I think he was actually trying to show us the sort of separate lives of, of the order in Castalia versus the Plinio's world of the outside world where Plinio has a wife and family and, um, you know, Joseph Neck does not because it's sort of monastic. It's not religious, but monastic and it's only males and they don't get married. Um, if they do choose to get married and have families, you know, they have to leave the order. They have to leave the province. So I think that was part of the reason why this time I was already aware that women were not going to be in the book, so I didn't, I didn't, I weren't, I wasn't annoyed by that this time because I was already knew that's how it was going to be, and so I just accepted it, the story for for how it was written and for what it was, and um, there's a lot to take away from it, you know, outside of that. Do I wish that it included women? Yes, I do. I wish it had. Um, I think if it was written today, maybe it would, um, but um, at the time, this is how it got written, and. Um, so anyway, I just was able to engage on it in a, in a whole different level. And then the other thing is the bead game. I think last time I did not understand the bead game. I didn't really quite understand the concept of the bead game. And I think this time I read it through real slowly, and I think I, you know, I understand it better. Um, and at this book, speaking of reading it slowly, this is not a book. I think I read this book. The other problem I had with it last time, I think I read it too fast. I was pouring through a lot of books at the time, and I came across this and read it pretty fast. This book is not a book, I don't think, that does well reading really quickly. Um, it's pretty dense. Um, it's uh, written in sort of an archaic style. Um or what we might call archaic style, you know, old-fashioned style, very cumbersome, you know, dense sentences, complicated sentences sometimes that are beautiful and they're very lyrical, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not conducive to a quick read. Um, and, um, you know, I just ultimately, I loved reading it again. I love stories about wanderers and seekers and Joseph Necht is a, is definitely a seeker. Uh, he's not so much a wanderer. Um, he stayed pretty much in Castilia his whole life until the very sort of end um, and a couple of brief surgeons out. But, um, you know, I love that. Um, he did have, there is a poem, uh, the end of the book actually has um, some of his poetry, uh, you know, it's all fictionalized, Joseph Neck's poetry as well as um, some sketches of previous lives that he had, three of them. One is an Indian prince, one is a um, like a, a early Christian aesthetic hermit, and then another one as a pagan ancient rainmaker. So those are really kind of cool little short stories at the very end. But the poem I think is very beautiful, so I'm just going to close with that real quick. It says, As every blossom fades and all youth sinks into old age, so every life's designed, each flower of wisdom, every good attains its prime and cannot last forever. At life's each call, the heart must be prepared to take its leave and to commence afresh, courageously and with no hint of grief, submit itself to other newer ties. A magic dwells in each beginning and protecting us tells us how to live. Isn't that beautiful? A magic dwells in each of us. A magic dwells in each beginning protecting us it tells us how to live i think that's so beautiful um and yeah he had to um he had lots of new beginnings in his life even though he stayed in this one province for most of it he had several awakenings that took him on new um new new sort of journeys um and new new uh levels of understanding so i'm going to leave it with that um until next time take care